Hello everybody and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn, I'm here with Jeremy Lord. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we are creating and streaming from today. We'd also like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this is part two of a two-part series. We had a lot of fun yesterday with kind of going back to basics, mastering the basics of digital drawing in Photoshop. We had a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, we're excited for you to, um, to be here with us. Um, so if you missed that, you can jump back and check out that stream. It's available on YouTube or Behance. Um, went through a lot of good things and we've got way more in store with Jeremy today. So what up, Jeremy Lord? How are you? What is happening? I'm good. Thanks. How is everybody going? Yeah, I hope we'll, you're um, doing well. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll continue off on yesterday's one. So yesterday um we were looking at like super super basics of um photoshop like stuff like you know making a new file documents um some differences in between photoshop and illustrator and sort of file settings and that kind of stuff and um the the, the core of yesterday's stream was kind of making and using brushes how do brushes in photoshop work um kind of like a little bit techy and a little bit nerdy um, which is fine, but um, definitely um, required knowledge if you're going to be using um, fancy brushes. And I think one of the last things we spoke about last um, last stream on yesterday, um, before we kind of ran out of time, was this idea of like how many brushes do you create? Um, do you create very many? Do you have a different brush for everything mm. that you draw? Um, and the answer is no. I think it's like you. There's definitely a point where, like, if you're relying on the brush to help you draw the thing well, um, that's where the problem is. I think the brush is there to help you draw it faster, in a way. Right. But it's not like, yeah, it's not going to help you. Like, if you don't know how to draw a hand, you're not going to find a hand brush and it's like, hey, now I can draw a hand. Um, yeah. You will find um, different things like smoke brushes and things, but like I said yesterday, they're, they're just photographs of smoke. They don't, they're not going to work in that same kind of way um, as you'd kind of expect there. So um, my advice would always be to just use like, if you can do everything using the like standard round brush, like one of these guys or, or something like this, for instance, like just a simple round brush no fanciness and then you just rely on your drawing skills to draw everything if you can do that then you'll be fine um but there are brushes that will help you just get stuff a bit faster it's like you know how to do this but instead of having to draw every single blade of grass uh, the brush will do it for you and that's good right yeah um yeah so that was kind of like the one of the main things that we looked at yesterday so today i wanted to talk a little bit about like once you've got a kind of a sketch going um what do you do with it like how do you layer it up how do you maybe start adding some color into it um can you make edits because that's the whole point right the whole point of digital is you can make changes you can make edits pretty easily without having to redo the whole thing which this is where it kind of trumps um analog and kind of working in a sketchbook especially when you're working commercially with clients where they're likely to make changes in fact they're, they're most definitely going to make changes mm. um you don't have to redo the whole thing and you can send over a digital file rather than posting a giant canvas to them it's like here's your thing have fun using this on a you know cereal box or whatever um so yeah so digital is, is going to be key for this so how do we make edits to this what kind of edits are good to make what kind of edits are this that kind of maybe not so good to make um so yeah, so we won't look too much into into coloring, but more onto the, the the sketching side. But we will touch upon that. So here I've got this sketch. Sorry, just before we just before we jump jump in, I have to just um, admit that my excitement of adding confetti to the stream, um, <laughs> which I mentioned to you before we started, it's got a mind of its own, and it seems to just go off anytime I change a scene. Uh, so if you see that, that was confetti was meant to be welcoming Johanna back to Adobe Live. Um, but it's decided just to go off every time I switch a scene. So um, there Wait, might be not? extra confetti today. Um, just a little bit overly excited um, to welcome back Johanna. So yeah, there we go. Continue. Yeah, we got the whole crew back. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what I've got here, I'm, I'm just going to talk really quickly about this. Um, by the way, if you saw me changing um, 
views here and modes. I'm literally just playing F on my keyboard, F for Frank, and that will switch in between these views. So it's something that's handy to have mm -hmm. um, whenever you're working on this. If you want to see the, the picture with like, without any stuff around it, um, get a good look at your artwork. Um, or if you want to switch tabs. So I've got this open. So this sketch is actually something that I've done in my sketchbook. Um, so if your thing, I just wanted to touch upon this real quick. If your thing is, I like to draw by hand. I just prefer drawing by hand, but I'd like to be able to color in Photoshop using that hand base. Obviously you can do that as well. Um, and this allows me to kind of talk a little bit about adjustment layers and, and potentially layer masks as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this um, pencil like ink sketch that's got a whole bunch of different colors. It's a photograph of this, as you can see. So there's a bit of like lighting issues and all that kind of stuff. And how do I get it to be almost perfectly just black and white? So I could literally just go onto this and go into my menus up here, into my image adjustments and start messing around with these things. So if I put in like a first thing I want to do is desaturate this, right? Um, because if I'm going to play around with light and dark and levels, which is basically kind of like a, a fancier version of light and dark, I don't want any color to be in there. I need it to just be black and white. So that information will speak to Photoshop a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go in here and just do this one. Um, and by the way, if you're kind of new to Photoshop and you're looking at all these menus and you hear everybody talking about shortcuts, 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 and you're like, where the hell do I find these shortcuts? More often than not, the more kind of frequent shortcuts that you'll be needing to do are going to be next to the thing in the menu. So here you'll see that this is like the little symbol for command. Um, on a PC, that'd be control plus U. So I can click on this and it will bring up this menu or I can just do shortcut command U and it will bring up exactly the same menu. Um, so this, what I'm doing now is destructive. Right? So let's say I desaturate this down and I hit return. What I've now done, if I save, close, turn off my computer, come back tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't like the desaturation. I'd like the color back, please. Too late. You've destroyed the color. Right. That's You've it. deleted it's the data. Now. Exactly. That's what we talk about when we talk about destructive. We mentioned this yesterday, um, but it's, it, I think it's better to show it with an example. So that data is now locked in. Your answer is locked in. You can't go back. That's it. Like you can't make that, you can't revert that change. Yeah. So we're going to undo that and we're going to do what's called an adjustment layer. Um, so up here, you'll notice that when I went into image menu adjustments, all these things also exist in my layers panel. If I go down to here and click on this guy, this little kind of like semicircle black and white, you'll see if I hover over it, it'll say create a new fill or adjustment layer. So I'm going to go click on that and I'm going to pop down this menu. And you can see I've got all the same options that I had in there. So I'm going to go hue saturation. Um, this, by the way, to my knowledge, can't be done with a shortcut. You have to do it like the, the, the clicking way. You can't make an adjustment layer via a shortcut that I know of. Happy to be shown otherwise, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what that does now is it brings up exactly the same menu, but you'll see that it's put a bunch of different things on here. So I'm going to desaturate that. Same visual result, but if I save, close this, reopen it tomorrow, I've got this layer, I can just turn it off and I've got my color. So that information hasn't been destroyed. That's what right. we call non-destructive workflow, right? As much as possible and whenever possible, you want to work this way um, rather than like, you know, actually physically applying the thing to your layers and not having potentially the option to go back later on. Um, that's always a little bit of an issue. So we can do this. And also this is completely editable, right? I can double click back onto my little icon here. So this is my adjustment icon. The thing next to it is a layer mask. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, if I double click back on, it'll bring up that menu. I can change it back to like, hey, let's make it super saturated. Mm. So I can just edit this as much as I want. Um, and it's gonna be a lot easier for me to handle. And I can put another one on as well. So I want one for levels. I'm gonna go back to that button. I'm gonna click on levels. It's gonna add in another one. And this is where I'm going to start messing around with the light and dark. So I'm going to boost the white value. 
Um, don't worry too much about what this graph looks like. It looks super technical, like oh, I'm not a photographer, I don't understand how this works. Basically, the white, if you move it, everything moves towards the middle. If you move the white up, you can see that it's making the whites, intensifying the white in my drawing up to a point where basically the whole canvas is white. Um, so I'm just going to boost that up to get the white of the paper. The black on the other side, if I boost, bring that into the middle, it's going to intensify the blacks and make that like very, very saturated and very dark contrasty. And then the mid-tones in the middle is going to kind of do the same thing as the black, but um, in a sort of like a more refined way and slightly more controllable way. So I'm not too... I'm displeased with that. I'm not, it's not perfect, right? I'm losing some information here. Like you can see here, I've got like a chopstick. If I boost, because that pencil drawing is quite light, if I boost that, that's going to be the first thing to go in my drawing. Right. So there's always a little bit of leeway happening here. So let's, let's put that in there and let's look at um, bringing this in. So what I can do now is I can actually take this and I'm going to duplicate this. Right? So I've selected all these layers by holding down um, Shift. And I'm going to do um, Command J. And that's going to duplicate all of that. The reason I'm doing that is I'm going to take it, duplicate it, put it on a different layer and draw behind it. So now I can smash all of these together. But I've still got the working file somewhere else. So I don't need to worry too much about like being non-destructive. Right? Um, so Command J is going to duplicate that. Um, I can also go to my menu here and it will find me a thing that says duplicate layers. Um, so that will work there. And then I'm going to group these, which is merge layers, Command E. So Command E smashes those layers together. And now I can take that and put that into a new document. So I'm going to copy that, Command C with the layer selected. Command N for a new file and stick it into an A4, why not? And then Command V will paste that in. Cool. So I've now got this as, um, as much of a white background as I can possibly manage without losing too much of the line work. Um, as you can see, I've still got some issues down here, but because that's nice and white on the edges, I can very easily get rid of that. And I can also get rid of the pencils on this side with my selection tool, just drag a selection around that, get rid of that, and we're good to go. Yeah. So this is now where, if you're working with a sketch layer, this is the most important thing to remember. This is the thing that you're gonna be using most often whenever you're drawing, even from a digital sketch or an analog sketch, doesn't matter, you're probably gonna be doing the same thing on either one. Um, because what's happening here is I've got a lot of white, yeah? So normally what you would do if you were doing this analog is you would do your drawing, then you would paint on top of it. But with digital, we're actually gonna be doing it the other way around. We're gonna be putting stuff underneath the layers. So let me show you how that works real quick. I'll do this very, very basically and very quickly, and then we can get into the digital drawing part of things. Um, if I have got a new layer, and I start painting on here, you can see that it's actually painting on top of my drawing, which is a bit of a pain in the butt because I now have to be like super careful and, you know, kind of stay within the line here, but it's gonna, it's not gonna be great, right? I'm yep. not gonna get a very good result. Um, but if, like I said, I paint underneath it because I've got white, I'm, I'm not gonna see my drawing. So what I need to do is I need to select my drawing layer, call this one sketch. Oops, not sledge, sketch. Not scooch either. I'm fat fingering this <laughs> massively. Um, Always when people gonna, are watching. <clears throat> totally. Uh, and I'm gonna go into my layer and up here, you'll see a thing that says normal. These are my blending modes, right? So if I go through these, you can see there's heaps and heaps of blending modes. Again, don't worry too much about what all of these do. I'm not sure about like probably 60% of these. I have no idea. Uh, but the one I do know and the one that works the best is multiply. Multiply. So put your drawing layer on multiply. And then magically, you will see that anything that I draw underneath that will 
show me the adequate color for it. So this is just the, your, your standard, like, hey, I did a sketch, I scanned it in, um, or I photographed it in this instance. If you scan it in, you probably don't have to do all the steps that I did before because you're gonna get a perfect, like nice, flat, um, even color throughout. Um, but if you do, if you don't have a scanner and you do kind of photograph it and you're trying to tweak it afterwards, then this is the way to do it. Just get it as close as possible to white paper with a black line, yep. put it on multiply, paint underneath. Um, speaking it. of like white paper, I've got a question from Michael. Um, yeah, and if you yep. guys have questions as we're going along, please throw them in. Uh, question is, do you prefer a white background or like an eggshell slash yellow tint in the background of your art? Good question. So this one, you'll see has, I've actually gone in and put a paper texture that's got a little bit of like a yellow cream color. Now, something to remember when you're messing around with um, Multiply is Multiply actually takes colors. Imagine if they were like on a, on a clear gel, right? Like if you had like a red gel on top of a white light, it would make all that white light but if you then come around and put like a blue gel on top of that red gel you're going to get a purple light so they multiply together right okay right so with this now like let's say uh i'm going to go in with a blue here and i'm going to show you how this works um on my layer in the background i've got a um a blue and i'm going to make my sketch layer a little bit more yellow so I'm going to go back to my hue saturation. I'm going to colorize this, boost the um, saturation, drop the darkness down and make it yellow. Oh, not green, not oh, yellow. Right. So now what you can see is happening is that is making my blue a different color. Mm. Right? It's a little so bit like I'm... watercolor, like thinking about it from a watercolor perspective. Totally. totally. Yeah. Um, so it's not like it should make it green. It's not quite getting there because it's not exactly working the same way that like light works in the real world. Um, but that's the basic principle. This is why you need to get as close as possible to white on the paper if you're going to be using multiply. Otherwise, your colors are going to be there. To answer the question though, in terms of like, do I like a little bit more warmth in there? I usually do, uh, but that's a personal choice. And, and sometimes that might just be down to what the client requires um but yeah cool good question um hey i've got another one as well from alessandra it says yeah. um they haven't used photoshop in a while last time they were on it saw that some things had moved um what is a tool that ended up being somewhere that you least expected <laughs> um oh um i think i had some issues with when stuff moved around I had some nightmares trying to find the um, gradient tool for a while, I think. I seem to remember. Yeah, because it got I'm kind of sure merged with like the moved. paint Yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So I, there's there's been a few things that have moved. I, to be honest, like my workflow is pretty straightforward, so I don't use a heap of things. Um, and I, th I think that's another key thing with Photoshop is like, I don't think... I've met anybody who knows everything about Photoshop, aside from like the Adobe evangelists who like know all the features, but from a professional standpoint, um, if you're a photographer, you know Photoshop for photography. If you're an illustrator, you know Photoshop for illustration and so on and so forth. Like yeah. I don't know camera raw and I don't know all those things. Like, and you don't need to, that's, that's not my thing. I don't need to know that. Um, so don't be intimidated by all the millions of menus and sub menus in here. Like you probably won't need to need them all to do your job well. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be too intimidated by it all because yeah, you really don't, yeah. you really don't need it all. It's, um, yeah, that's, that's great. And just final question, um, from Zach, uh, what, uh, sort of tablet are you using? I am using a big Cintiq. Um, so it's a, like a pen with a, a screen table. I don't know if like, I can't really show you, um, how that works. We'll, we'll share it's... a link or so we'll share a link <laughs> yeah. or something. It's basically like you, you got two different types of tablets. You got ones where you like, you draw here, but you look at the screen. 
Um, and you've got other ones that are the screen. So you're looking at where you're drawing, which feels a lot more natural because it's that's how you draw normally. Mm. Um, so I've got one of those um, and it's pretty big and like I love it. But yesterday we talked a little bit about brush settings and how that changes when you've got a drawing tablet, um, mm. which is a crucial part of any kind of illustrator's career if you're going to be working digitally. Um, okay. So with that out of the way, we can kind of come back to, to our drawing here. So. I've, I've re-sketched this um, drawing to get it to just be fully digital um, using a really simple, like fuzzy um, pencil brush, as you can see. Um, I do this because rarely ever, or almost never really, do I have the sketch as the final thing on a print or hand over to the client. I will go in and clean it up. So it actually doesn't really matter to me what brush I use to do this. And in fact, if you go to my brushes, of which I have quite, like, I don't have very many in here. These are the ones that I use all the time. I've got all these kind of open down here that don't worry too much about those, but these are the ones that I would kind of use most. The one that I have created for sketching is this round sketcher one, and it's just a round brush with a opacity um, and a um, size, like pressure sensitivity size difference. So it's it's like one of the most like basic brushes you could really do and, and use in Photoshop. Uh, again, because like it, this is just a sketch, it'll go away when the inking comes in. So it doesn't really matter. Right. But, so the sketching is just a guide for you, really. Totally. It's like you're totally. writing notes to yourself. Yep. Um, and later on, like if I kind of, hey, I prepared this earlier, if I fast forward a little bit, you can see that I've got like the clean line work. Like this is what makes it into the final artwork, right? right? Um, so it doesn't matter what I use for this, but if your jam is like, I want stuff that looks like pencil drawings, um, and that's totally cool. Like I love doing that as well. Um, it's just not really my style of my career, but you can get like tons and tons of brushes that look exactly like pencils where it's almost impossible to tell the difference. Mm. Um, and I have students all the time asking me like, is this digital or analog? And like more and more, I'm like, I have no idea. It could be <laughs> either one. Um, so we've got a sketch here. Um, as you can see, it's it's a little bit kind of muddled in the middle. It's kind of hard to see what's going on because I've kind of smashed it all together. So one of the things that I like to work with, um, I like to work with blue and pink. Um, this a hang the blue is a hangover from animation where we use blue pencils to kind of do sketches and then we go over the top with like black line work because it's just, it becomes a bit easier to see. Um, and then when you shoot in black and white on an animation line tester, the blue doesn't show up. Um, right. So it's just an easy way to have a sketch that goes away when you do the final and you can just work on top of it. So that's a hangover for that. And then the pink is because pink is awesome and it's a good contrast <laughs> to blue. So yeah, that's that's a just because kind of answer why yep. pink. But the, the point here is I'm doing this in blue and then I'm going to do a bunch of add-ons in a different color on a different layer just so that I can kind of see what's happening a little bit more it avoids me especially on these noodles like if i'm gonna put in one of these little um naruto these little like fish cakes um or this ramen if i want to put that and have to like you know cleanly erase all these little noodles and like oh wait i put it in the wrong place i want to move it later on that's a bit of a pain in the butt mm. right so there is a, there is definitely a point to doing this kind of thing where like if you're like, hey, I wonder if I should put in another one of those little fish cakes somewhere else. It might be a good idea to put it on a separate layer um, and sketch it out like wherever you want. All right, so we'll stick it here. And then what I can do is I can edit this separately. Um, and one of the things that I'm gonna do, again, if you're new to Photoshop, this is like one of the most basic features of Photoshop, it's like kind of almost like layers, bare level basic, is the transform tool, the move and transform tool. So Command T or Control T for transform, and you get this what we call a bounding box. This allows me to rotate. It allows me to resize. If I hold down, if I don't hold down Shift, you'll see that it distorts it. If I hold down Shift, it does it proportionally. I can rotate it. I can move it around. So this is a good way to just go like, hey, where could I? put this that mm. looks good like do i put it here do i make him a bit smaller do i stick him maybe he goes behind here right uh, he'll go behind here because i'm now going to use a layer mask to hide it 
and this will allow me to kind of like talk a little bit about Lamas. So I'm going to stick him there and I want to make him go behind. I don't know why he's a guy, by the way, um, gender assignment to this little fish cake. Um, but I, I, like I could just erase it, right? So E for eraser, done. Right. It's behind my little capsule thing. But again, that's super destructive because if I save, close, reopen, and I'm like, ah, actually, I don't like it there. I want to move it back somewhere else. Oh, I've only got half my thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my panel down here where I've got a whole bunch of different things, and I'm going to go to this one, this little, like, TV with a circle in it. Um, and if you can see what that says, it just says add layer mask. So that's going to add a layer mask to this. And watch what it does on my layer here. There we go. It's added this little extra thing with this little chain link. These two are linked together. What that's now going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to do what's called a hiding layer. Right, so it's it's a it's a mask. It's a clipping mask in photo in Illustrator. It's a clipping mask in Photoshop. It's just called a layer mask. It's the same thing. It's going to mask or hide, but not delete. Um, so at the moment, when I'm on my layer, I've got indications of what is selected. So you can see that when I click on one versus the other, I've got little bit like brackets around one or the other. So I've got a layer and a layer mask. So on the layer. If I go over to my colors, you can see that I got pink and white, which is what I was drawing with. If I then click on my layer mask, you'll notice that that has now gone to black and white. Mm. So a layer mask works only in black and white. And what it will do is if you paint black, so I'm going to hit X on my keyboard and it will switch in between these two foreground and background colors, as you can see here. All right, so that's just X. And I'm going to go back to my brush and make it a little bit bigger with my bracket buttons. And I'm going to paint black onto this. And you can see that it looks like it's erasing it. All right. But if I swap colors, if I come back with white, I'm now going to re-show that. Mm. And I don't actually have to draw it back in. It's just hiding it. I'm painting a mask on top of it. And if you can see... If I zoom in on this little guy here, you can see there's a tiny little like black speck oh, yeah. where that has happened, right? And if I come back in, like, let's say, um, I'm going to paint that back out. I'm going to reshow this. That little black speck is now completely gone. Well, not completely gone, but you get the idea. So black hides, white shows again. But the cool thing about this is, like I said, I can take this off and it's still there. So this is non-destructive. I haven't destroyed any of the drawing at this stage. Um, so I'm going to use this. But now let's say that I want to move my layer here, uh, but kind of like just have it be so that there's something that lives on this capsule that just hides this fish cake wherever it goes and not have to have a half fish cake here. Mm. So that is doable simply by clicking on this little chain link in between the two here and unlinking them. Now I've turned that off. And what's going to happen now is if I select my layer and you need to make sure that you're on your layer, not your layer masks. If your bracket are around your layer masks, what's going to happen is it's going to do this. Right. It's going to move the mask over the layer. We don't want that. We want to move the layer underneath the mask and there we go cool that is now kind of being hidden wherever i put my layer there's going to be a mask there waiting for it that will hide it to go behind that particular um piece there very cool um so yeah so it's it's pretty cool um but it's also like you know great power comes great responsibility if every single one of these elements is on its own layer you're going to have a minefield of a file in no time at all right and you're going to try and make edits to all these things and you're not going to remember them especially if you're not naming them um you're not going to remember which one's which but i've got like two different narutos in here so which one's which like do i call it naruto one naruto two how do i remember in a week which one's which it like there's a there's a limit to how many layers you should be creating and how at one at some point you kind of have to just go 
I'm just going to trust myself to do this. I'm going to apply that change, which is kind of destructive, but it's also like you can't just be non-destructive all the time. Otherwise, you just end up with like 50,000 layers and it's just a, a headache. Yeah. Um, but now I've got this on a separate layer. I could actually just go in and say, look, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident that this is the right call. I like it where it is. I'm going to select these two, command E, I'm going to merge them back together. It has applied that layer mask, so that has now been destroyed. But again, I've made my choice. I'm living with it. Good to go. Um, cool. So um, what I'm going to do now... Yeah. Also, I was going to say, um, Alessandra um, in chat says, love this drawing, by the way. Um, oh, me thanks. too. Is it like ramen coming out of like capsule? It's like capsule court. Capsule yeah, it's like a, yeah. Um, I guess it's like a, like Akira Dragon Ball ramen. Yeah, like a Dragon Ball. Like a little bit of weird stuff happening. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and actually, I'm going to add in something else into here um, to kind of get in. This is going to, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the um, symmetry tool and we're going to talk a bit more about the transform and wall tool which is something that's going to be super fun um, to work with so let's make a new layer and i'm going to call this guy um Darima because in my original drawing here um, if i again fast forward to the future this is the final kind of inky Whoa. drawing with that's all the awesome. colors and everything um, we won't get that far today no way um, but I'm just going to show you how to make this little guy here and kind of apply it so that it looks like it's on a cylinder, like it's been painted on this kind of, kind of curved surface. Um, so, again, Photoshop, all about shortcuts, all about making your life easier, but you still kind of have to do the work. There's no like, hey, draw this for me, right? Well, not yet, anyways. Um, so, new layer. Go up here to my little kind of this little butterfly symmetry tool icon um, and then you can see if I hover over it it will say set symmetry um, hello. there we go I can click on that there's a whole range of different symmetries in here some of them are wackier than others the one I'm really looking for is vertical and by default it'll put a vertical line in the middle of my canvas and I have to hit return because if I don't you can see that it's actually got a bounding box around it so this is allowing me to like move it or put it somewhere else or rotate it even if i want to that kind of stuff i don't want to do any of that i just want to leave it as is um and then on my thing here it's going to let me kind of and i'm going to do it in a different color just so that we can kind of see a little bit better it's going to draw duplicate on either side whatever i do on one side so this is uh, something that i actually use quite often um, the symmetry tool. It's super fun to use. Um, you can get some really interesting drawings where you can just you just draw half of a drawing and it's like doing doing the other half for you. You get some really kind of fun experimental stuff happening. Um, I don't have to be around that line, by the way. Like this is cutting my entire canvas in half. So wherever I draw, it doesn't have to like stop here, for instance. Mm. Um, wherever I draw, it's going to do that symmetry. So let me just draw a quick like rough kind of version of that kind of Dharma doll face. Um, this also works with the eraser, by the way. So if I mess up and if I come in with the eraser, you'll see that it also is erasing as I'm going, which is super fun. Um, also, if you're trying to doing this and you, like I've drawn a few of these before, but if you're trying to do this and you're not getting it and like just use reference, always, always, always reference is going to be super important for this. I've, I've done a few of these, so I kind of know what it looks like. Yeah. Um, you cue the first time I mess up on this, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, should have waited until you finished before you s made such bold claims. Um, yep. Also, just checking in with chat, you're making us all very hungry. Um, <laughs> it is, it is, especially the colored it version like, it actually looked very very tasty yeah. um, and then also uh, Johanna was asking before have you tried using Adobe Capture to simplify the steps in the scanning part of your process um, I have 
but to be honest like the days where i used to do anything in my sketchbook and then have to scan it in uh sort of like gone and i'm not too happy about it but i have used adobe capture and if it's something that you do a lot where you've got like an analog sketch to put in and you need to kind of stick it in there without having to do all the steps then yeah absolutely adobe capture is super good for that but yeah, like I said, it, it's not something that I do very often anymore. So I don't really worry about it too much. Yep. So short answer is no, I don't really use a dirty capture, but it's not because I don't like it. Fair enough. Um, what is this guy called? This guy? Yeah. What is this? Um, this is it's like Mark. It's kind like of I like recognize a... it, but I don't know what it. Don't know what. It's a take on one of these things that you've probably seen, which is what is called a Dharma doll. Yeah. Um, that it. usually has like two, like one eye is painted. Like you, both eyes are unpainted. You make a wish, you paint an eye in. If your wish comes true, you paint the other eye in and then you burn it. Oh, um, I didn't know yeah. any of that. Yep. You're supposed to burn it afterwards to like, I can't remember exactly the. But the your wish has already come true, so. Your wishes come true, so it's just a way of like, yeah. But it's it's one of these ones that you've probably seen before. They're usually like red, black, and white. Yeah. Uh, yeah so it's definitely. just a it's a take on that. Um, this also, by the way, because I've now done this, this allows me to kind of show one of the the weird things. And if you're listening, Adobe, please fix this. Um, <laughs> where if I make a selection on my symmetry tool, it will not erase both sides nor will it if i hit delete it will only delete the one side so uh, it's one of those things like you you have to not be selected which makes sense because the selection tells you like hey i'm only going to work to this thing um but it would be really awesome to be able to make a selection on one side and be able to edit it from the other but anyway yeah that's interesting I digress. I, i'd imagine that like because this selection tool has been so integral in photoshop yeah. since forever and yep. then the symmetry is relatively new comparatively it's probably like older tech like it's like you can't select more than one thing with the lasso kind of thing totally. like it doesn't totally. wasn't built that way yeah yeah and it's, I'll, uh, it's, I'll like, pass it it's, it's not the end of the world but yeah it would be awesome to have that um so we've got our um our like dharma doll here that we've drawn um I'm going to select this, so Command T. And I've got a nice, clean, rectangular bounding box around this. I'm going to flip in this way to kind of go on there. And I'm going to rescale it and put it kind of like here. All right. Now, I need um, him just to kind of quickly like jump in and say, um, Paloma from chat um, has said that I really like it, but it looks like an evil Xbox controller. <laughs> it does a little bit. It does a little it bit. Does, yeah. That's cool. Um, so I've got two options at this stage. I could either use the liquify tool, which I'll show you in a sec, um, or I can use the warp tool straight up from here. So I'm going to use the warp tool, which is this guy up here. Whilst my selection, when my um, transform is still active, I've still got the bounding box around, as you can see. I'm going to go up to click on this guy and it doesn't look like it's done anything, but if I now take any of these points, I can actually pop up a grid and start to kind of like warp this and bend it to make it look like it's on this like cylindrical surface. Mm. So it's just a, again, it's a nice, easy way that like digital allows you to do things a little bit more simply without having to draw the thing on a curve which is which would be a nightmare like have a symmetry on a curve in perspective like right. explode your brain yeah but if you just do it flat and then change it to warp it on a separate layer because you're doing it digitally then you don't have to deal with any of that stuff um and, and it's it's something that i use quite frequently um when i'm working on this kind of stuff mm. so i hit return and we're good to go we've got that um face on there the other way i can do this if i undo all of this and rotate resize stick him roughly kind of there and um, we'll make him uh, we can just erase that a little bit later on um, i'm going to apply that now i'm going to use something which is called the liquify filter or liquify tool 
um, which I actually use a fair bit when I am kind of making my sketch first. Before I get into inking, I'm going to maybe edit it, edit stuff later on. Mm. Um, I would use this liquify tool a, a fair bit, just as I would use the transform tool. But if I go up into my filter here and go to liquify, and it's going to bring up this menu. It can make your computer chug a little bit if you're doing this, depending on how big your file is, um, depending on what you're doing to it as well. Yeah. Um, it might kind of slow your computer down a little bit. So just be aware of that because it's this is a pretty RAM intensive thing to, to do to your computer. Um, what I'm doing now is I've got a bunch of options in here. I can kind of do a whole range of crazy stuff to this. Um, some of it, again, is pretty wacky. Like I can make it look like he's like slowly getting flushed down a toilet drain. <laughs> um, it's like twist, twist filter <laughs> or something. Um, the one that I'm after is this one, forward warp tool. This is gonna kind of act like my thing is like liquefied and I can just push stuff around the page like it was all just kind of goop. Um, so now what I can do is I can take this and just kind of like bend it this way a little bit. Mm. Um, I don't have as much control over this, as much information control as I am on my warp tool in transform, but it is a different way to do this. Now, you're probably noticing something that's here, which is like, well, this is annoying because I can't see the thing that I'm warping it onto. So where's my reference? So what you need to do is go to this one where it says, whoa, stream zoom, um, show backdrop. It's a little, the wording's a little bit weird. What it will do is it'll just show you the other layers. Mm, um, right. It's also showing you the original layer. That's cool. Uh, and you can, you can change the opacity of that if you kind of need to see what you're doing. And then you can kind of. So it shows um, you like the pre liquefier, like where you started. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. to show you, you know, oh, okay, cool. That's, that's working or it's not working. And then I can just hit okay. And we, will be applying that to our image. All right. So it's not as good as the warp, but it's 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 an option for you to use as well. Um, where I do use this a little bit more is on stuff like this, like this noodle, for instance, like, oh, I want that to be more bent um, or more kind of like going in the right way. So I select my layer. I can change the size of this and then just kind of go like, yeah, that's a bit better. Um, make this a little bit more kind of curved. Um, there are limits to how much you can do this, um, but it, it, it can be something that is like, you can redraw, you can change a thing without having to redraw the whole thing. Um, I use this on like, oh, this, the head's too big or the neck's at a weird angle on like human proportions and stuff. This is a lifesaver a lot of the time. It just, it just means you can just make these little kind of quick edits without having to like break the bank in terms of like time. So you can it's see. Cool. And you can experiment a little bit like faster totally. as well. You can just say, oh, what if it was like this or, or like that rather than kind of going back and trying to get those lines yeah. right. Um, and then the final thing that I would do, again, in order to like edit this drawing, in order to like, oh, I'm not happy with it. Before I start inking, I want to make sure that I'm really happy with this, is I'm going to use the transform tool. And I'm going to change an anchor point of something to, to rotate it around that. So let's say I want this noodle to like not be in, on that angle. I want it to be more angled. Um, and liquify is just not going to cut it for that. So I need to make a rough selection around this. And I'm going to hit Command T. And in the middle, I've got this like target, this little like crosshairs thing. This is the point around which something is going to rotate. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I move this to like here, all of a sudden it's going to rotate around yeah, that's that really cool. particular anchor point. So it allows me to kind of like have the thing start from the same point, but it's just rotating. So I use this heaps for instance like if i've got um if i've gone and drawn like a, a pose with like a, a a person for instance and there's like the legs are here and there's like a there's an arm that's coming out of here for instance and the other one's like doing this portions jeremy what are you doing um but this will allow me to kind of like almost like a puppet animation like i don't want that arm there i want it like here hello <laughs> um, so it's really like, it's a really easy way to 
to make edits on a drawing using that plus liquify tool to go like, all right, let's make this guy like boogie a little bit more like wee. <laughs> all right, so like exaggerate the pose, get, like you said, get some experimentation happening in something that you might not have done because your drawing might be a little bit too static. Mm. Um, it's a really good way to do it. And those are the things that I would use <clears throat> most often when I'm, again, making edits to my sketch. Um, yep. So that's that's the bulk of the kind of the, the sketching stuff that I use, using all these layers, using adjustment layers, um, using layer masks. Um, quick thing as well, before we get into some like very basic inking, um, is if you're kind of trying to figure out how to change the color of something like this guy up here, if I want him to be um, a different color, um, or if I want that, I'm going to be done. I'm going to be destructive here and just delete this because it's going around the edge of that thing. Um, I want this to be the same pink as this. So I could either do this by command U and change the color until I, I find exactly the right color, which is a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, or I can lock the transparency on this by either clicking on this little button up here this guy, this little like checkerboard, mm. and that will lock the transparency. Or if I hit forward slash on my keyboard, whoops, um, you'll see on this guy, there's gonna be a little padlock that appears just there. And that button is also depressed. So that will allow me to lock the transparency. I drop a color and then command and um, option delete fills with a foreground or a background color. Um, uh, got a selection go yeah um so if i've got that as there and then like let's say this is black so foreground background fills with pink so it's one of those things that can be really easy to like change the color of something later on um if i need to be like oh actually i need this to be black so i can kind of see it a little bit better i can make that edit really quickly yeah wow that's super useful that's such a quick thing but that seems like it would be super useful to be able to do yeah, I discovered that shortcut by accident, actually. <laughs> right. I meant to press something and I was like, whoa, it's done the thing I always wanted it to do. What did I press? And then you have to like go back through your history and figure out like what you did and how you did it. Um, but yeah, so now we're ready to basically add some kind of inking on top of this. So what I would normally do here is I would select all of these and hit Command G and make a group out of them mm. and call these ones sketches. You're not going to merge and them then, because we're working non-destructively. We're right? working non-destructively, yeah. And I don't need to unless unless other specific things are going to have to happen where I, I might need to merge them later on, but it's probably not going to be the case here. I can just keep them in here and then they can move around all together. I can drop the opacity of them all together at the same time. Like it just makes my life a bit easier and it yeah. cleans up my layer panel. Um, and then now I'm just going to go in and make a new layer on top of that, call this one outlines or inking, whatever you do. I usually use a shorthand OTL for outline. Yeah. Um, again, that's that's not like, hey, everybody does this. Jeremy said we needed to do this. Why aren't you doing this? This is just not, like, that's just what I do. Um, and I'm gonna go to this brush here, which is an inking brush. So this brush has, in the settings you'll see, it has a size pressure um, differential in here and it also has smoothing turned on so the smoothing which is up here <clears throat> is something that I use quite a bit when I'm inking because I'd like to have like my lines to be quite sort of like clean and smooth whenever I'm doing like a more like anime style art it needs to be a little bit cleaner um, what that will do is essentially like if you've had too many kind of coffees you've got this line that's a little bit like bit kind of dented it's kind of seen some some you know some action whereas if i boost the smoothing up that will kind of take those dents away from me like it's it's helping yeah. me kind of smooth that line down um if i boost this up to 100 you'll see that it's a little bit slower because it's obviously having to like calculate more stuff um but you'll get a much smoother line it's also lagging behind my brush as you can see yeah right? so if i drop this down to zero it's keeping up with where 
the actual like cursor of my brushes. If I boost it up to 100, you'll see that it's lagging quite far behind that cursor, which can be a bit tricky, right? Because if you're drawing and you're like trying to get this thing to line up to there, you might be tempted to stop where your cursor stops, but the line isn't going there. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you need to kind of look where the line is going, not where your brush is going, which is why I don't have it up to 100. I have it up to like 20 to 30%. Uh, and then I can start to ink this up, right? So I can start to kind of come in and where are we going to start? Uh, we're going to start here. You can start to come in and kind of ink this up based on the sketch that I did and, and work that way. Do you ever go far off your sketch lines? I guess you kind of just did then. Um it depends on like how impatient I get when I'm doing the sketch and like how yeah like a lot of the time I will kind of leave something undecided in the sketch and that like that's for future inking me to figure out and then future mm. inking me like curses past gets sketching me <laughs> Curse um, you past Jeremy. Like, why didn't you do this <laughs> now I gotta figure it out um that is definitely something that I I will do quite often um and sometimes I already know what I'm going to be doing and it's not a big deal, but there, there is like, it, it does take a bit of discipline for me to just be like, no, figure your drawing out and do it properly before you start inking it up. Um, you'll, you'll thank yourself later on. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's, there's absolutely, you know, some of that happening in there. Um, but the inking is going to be um, something that's going to take quite a while and, and this is where also we can talk a little bit about our brushes so this was lucky like yay that was super lucky this is where you can put your confettis on now because that this like nice perfect curve first go like never happens oftentimes whenever you see me doing like a time lapse i will do like one ah uh, no that's not it nope bent yep oh, almost and then just kind of like do it over and over and over again um because i don't like doing this i don't like doing this like fuzzy line i don't i don't think that's like it's just not what i like to do um which can be an issue when i'm doing things like these noodles because that this is all fine and good but let's say i i had like this was a noodle and then i have to like copy that exact same line and it has to be uh, nope i messed yeah. it up that's a that's a problem so this is where you can actually create a noodle brush and i'm going to do this and then we'll probably be right on time yeah two so, minutes three minutes to do a noodle brush so yesterday we went through how to make a brush um so here we go ready i'm gonna go in and i'm gonna make my noodle brush i'm gonna make a new layer and i'm gonna make using my brush um brown brush i'm not gonna use my pen i'm gonna use my mouse to make a perfect circle just click once and then underneath that, I'm gonna make another one. All right, uh, maybe a little bit thicker. So the space in between these two is how thick my noodle is gonna be. I, I know this probably is just like, how the hell is this gonna be a noodle? But up here, I'm gonna make a selection, go into edit, define brush preset, and we'll call this noodles two. Just already made one before. And then we got this. So now I can get rid of this guy. And I can, in my brush panel settings, go in and find my uh, noodle brush. So in my shape dynamics, brush tip shape, I'm gonna drop the spacing down to the minimum it can go. So 1%. And I'm gonna go into my shape dynamics and go angle jitter direction. And now when I draw this noodle, I've got two wow. perfectly parallel parabolic lines happening. That's now, awesome. I still need to be a little bit careful, right? Because I don't want, like, I could just do this and then go and erase in the middle of all these, like, noodles happening. Or I could be careful and just go, like, that one goes to there. Oh, but, it, like, this is where it can be a little bit tricky to kind of do this this way. Yeah. Um, but yeah it's definitely like this is one of those things it's like this brush will definitely make my life easier when drawing all these noodles like so um and then as you obviously i'll have to come back in 
and you know cap all these noodles off with the ends on just a normal brush like so um but yeah that's that's a good example of like that's a that's a worthy brush to make in this particular instance yeah yeah, I can totally see that like being super useful. If you drew, draw lots of like cartoon octopuses or something like that, like there's probably yeah. heaps of situations. I love that. Super simple and also ties or like, a lot of like together. cyberpunk drawings yeah. have like lots of tubes and cables. Like they're a nightmare to work with. So I like I have this brush just there, just because like I will do that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So and again, this is this is our final results um, that we've kind of got happening and, and you can see that it's like you know there's, there's a fair bit of work that's gone into this with layers that are on different kind of blending modes so we've got some opacity we've got some multiply um we've got different color inking lines but the, this is just what we've been doing like over like 50 times the amount of um hours right. working on it that's that's awesome actually that takes us to time so thanks everyone for hanging out with us um here on adobe live we'll be back next week and thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for taking us through all of that. That's my pleasure. All righty. And, um, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everybody, in chat, and uh, look after yourself. We'll see you next time on Adobe yeah. Live. Thanks for watching. Bye.